Here I am again. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to your people. Father, I don't take this lightly because I am held accountable for what comes out of this mouth. So, Father, please let your Holy Spirit speak through me. Humble me and put me behind the cross. And let your words be edifying to the people who hear it and to myself. Our ultimate goal is to spend eternity with you in paradise. And this is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Sermon. What did you say? Can you hear me? Okay. Today I'll be talking about the tongue. Have a picture? Okay. The tongue. We all have one. <laughs> the tongue is a muscular organ in the mouth. The tongue is covered with moist pink tissue called mucosa. Tiny bumps called papillae give the tongue its rough texture. Papillae help you grip food and it moves it around in your mouth while you chew. And they contain your taste buds. So you can taste everything from apples to zucchini. Your taste buds can detect sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and unami, which is savory. Thousands of taste buds cover the surface of the papillae. People are born with about 10,000 taste buds. But as a person ages, some of his or her taste buds die. That's why some older people may not taste food the same way as younger people do. The taste buds are also the collections, they have connect collections of nerve-like cells that connect and transmit taste signals to your brain. The average tongue is about three inches long and has eight muscles and is anchored to the mouth by webs of tough tissue. The tether holding down the front of the tongue, which is what you can see right here underneath here, that string-like area, is called the frenulum. And in the back of the mouth, the tongue is anchored down by the hyoid bone. The tongue is very flexible. And of course, it's vital for chewing, swallowing food, and for speech. Your tongue is a natural cleaner. Once you start eating food, it starts clearing out the food out of your teeth after you eat. It's funny, we have two kittens at home and all they do is clean themselves with their tongue. With all that talking, mixing food, swallowing, tasting, and germ fighting, does your tongue ever get rest? No, not the tongue. The tongue has amazing stamina that even while you're sleeping, it is busy pushing the saliva down your throat so that you don't choke. And if, if it didn't do that, you'd probably drool all over your pillows. So I'm saying the tongue works 24 hours a day. So why am I talking so much about the tongue? You can take that off now. I am speaking about the tongue because this little organ has an amazing power that leads and directs our lives, especially our spiritual lives. It is a formidable power that dwells within each of us. This power has changed the course of nations. It is capable of starting and ending wars. It has made men rich and women famous. It has the means to commend or to corrupt. It has the ability to bless or to blame. This potent force is the power of the tongue. And according to Proverbs 18 verses 21, that's Proverbs 18 verses 21, it says, 
death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. God greatly desires for us to use this power, the power of the tongue, to bring glory to his name and to advance his kingdom here on earth. He wants us to speak words of love and to declare his truth boldly to others. But Satan wants a piece of that action too. He wants our tongues to be weapons of destruction. He tries to keep us in the dark about the power of our words. And he entices us to use them for harm instead of hope. Saints, that's why we have to watch our mouths. We have to be careful what we say. But I will tell you, brothers and sisters, that's not such an easy thing to do. How can we ever hope to tame such a thing as this tongue that has the power to control the whole body? As the text you're reading says, you put bits in horses' mouths. I remember when I first got on a horse and I was like, oh, how am I going to control this thing? The person told me the bit in his mouth, if you want him to go right, you lean it to the right. If you want to go left, you lean it to the left. And if you want him to stop, you just gently pull back. The entire body of the horse was led by the mouth. <coughs> Let us look at James chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. That's James chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. And thank you so much, Brother Kinsler, for reading that. And it says, Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea, is tamed, and has been tamed of mankind. Can you imagine that? That says every creature, whether it lives in the sea, or on land, or in the air, at some point can be tamed. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Wow, it kind of seem, seems kind of hopeless, um, this thing. It's hopeless if we are man and relying on ourselves. But God can. If we rely on God, He can. Because Matthew chapter 19 verses 26 reminds us that with God all things are possible. So, one of the things I realized that we have to do is surrender ourselves. And I'm not talking about just the mouth, the whole self. You have to surrender to Jesus Christ. You have to surrender your body, your mind, and your soul. Our tongues must be submitted to the perfect will of God if we hope to master this great power we have been given to use to bless Him and bless others. One of the first things we must start with is our minds. Matthew chapter 12 verses 34 that's Matthew chapter 12 verses 34 here Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and he says O generation of vipers how can ye being evil speak good things for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh he was making very clear that what goes on in our minds determines the effectiveness or the value of what we say in our words. The heart here refers to the mind, the source of all your thoughts, the source of your feelings, the source of all your actions and your motives. As positive and negative actions come from your mind, so do positive and negative words come from your mouth. Matthew chapter 12, 35 goes on to say, A good man, out of the good treasure of the heart, 
bringeth forth good things, and an evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. So, if your mouth is saying bad things, what does that mean? It means bad thoughts are in your mind. And if you're saying good things, that means your mind is thinking good things. You see, our words and our thoughts, they come out through our mouths. So whatever you say reflects what's in your mind. I've heard some people say, oh, my tongue has a mind of its own. Really? But the tongue and what it says is based on the character who owns it. That's you. It's interesting because, you know, the physical color of the tongue can sometimes tell what kind of sickness you have or heart disease. That's just amazing. One of the things we have to also recognize is that the things that we say every day will have important consequences, not only to the people around us, but to our soul as well. This is so evidently seen in the next verse of Matthew chapter 12, verses 36, which for me was so consequential and really significant because it says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Every idle word that you speak shall be given a count of their off in the day of judgment. Let's pause here for a moment because that really hit me. <laughs> it really did. I had to think. I'm like, wow. It says the average person speaks about 16,000 words a day. That's enough to fill up an entire, like, tons of books a week. And you know some of us talk faster than others. So I'm thinking to myself, hmm, if I can remember during the week, or if you just pause for a while and you think to yourself, go through this past week, think about the words you said to your spouse, the words you said to your brothers and your sisters, young people, what you said to your parents, what you said to your co-workers, your neighbors, people you met on the street. If the angels are recording these things, are you proud? of all of the things that you said or that came out of your mouth? Honestly, uh, I have to say I was not when I stopped and thought about the things that I said. So in thinking and just realizing, I had to pause and say, wow, I have to be careful about this thing, this tongue. So then I said, well, how can my words, you know, be useful? Because they can either build up, motivate, encourage. My words can also tear down. They can cause horrible scars. Some of the things that you say can cause horrible scars that are there for life. I remember when I was a little kid, they had a saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's not true. Words can hurt. Some of us right here now are living with the scars and the hurt that people gave to you years ago and have not been healed and you're still living with those scars and you hold the people accountable in your mind and the funny thing is some of them don't even know that the words that they said to you were hurtful. Hmm. So how can we ensure that our words are used properly? Well, we have the Word of God. The Bible gives us lots of positive advice about how to use our words. One of the first things that we have to do is refrain from using attack words. Words that can be used like a weapon, that can lash out at people. Words that can cut like a knife or like a dagger. Because like I said, they cause wounds that sometimes take years to heal or don't heal at all. These words cannot be erased. Words are something that you can't take back. Once they come out of the mouth, that's it. You can apologize and the person can forgive you 
But that original hurt feeling that the person has, you can never take that back. So my brothers and sisters, that's why I have to look at the Word of God. So that, because He wants us to use our words, not as a weapon. He wants us to use our words to bless others. Amen. Proverbs 15 verse 1 says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. In mind, personality, and character, volume 2, pages 572, author Ellen G. White says, Unless we control our words and temper. We are slaves to Satan. We are in subjection to him. He leads us captive. All rattling and unpleasant, impatient, fretful words are an offering presented to his satanic majesty. And it is a costly offering, more costly than any sacrifice we can make for God. For it destroys the peace and happiness of whole families. It destroys health. And it eventually forfeits your eternal life of happiness. I don't want my life to be forfeited because of the words that come out of my mouth. She goes on to say, The restraint which God's word imposes upon us is for our own interest. It increases the happiness of our family and of all who are around us. It refines our tastes, sanctifies our judgment, and brings peace of mind and in the end everlasting life. Under this holy restraint, we shall increase in grace and humility, and it will become easy to speak right. The natural passionate temper will be held in subjection. An indwelling Savior will strengthen us every hour. Ministering angels will linger in our dwellings and with joy carry heavenward the tidings of our advance in the divine life. And the recording angel will make a cheerful, happy record. Those are the records that I want. Cheerful and happy ones. Second thing is how to help us tame our tongue, refrain from gossip. We need to be careful about the news we share concerning others. Someone said, there is only one thing as difficult as unscrambling an egg, and that's unspreading a rumor. It's almost impossible to do. Gossip is destructive, and it is subtle. Someone begins a conversation simply by saying, Did you hear? And before you know it, you're caught up in gossip. He who gossips to you will gossip about you. Proverbs 20 verse 19. That's Proverbs 20 verse 19. Warns us that he that goes about as a talebearer, a gossip, Reveal its secrets. Therefore, meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. And Proverbs 26, verse 22. That's Proverbs 26, verses 22. It says, Now the words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the inner parts of the belly. Saints, you gotta watch out for gossip. It seems harmless at first, but when it starts to spread, it destroys friendships, it destroys marriages, it destroys families. And many times, your intent when you start to say something is not really how it ends up. But when it goes from your mouth to your mouth to your mouth to your mouth, by the time it's finished, it spreads like fire. And it destroys like fire. So that's why it's important to refrain from gossip. Instead, when something happens and someone comes to you about somebody's situation or issue, take the time to pray with that person about the person's situation or issue. In Steps to Christ, pages 119, it says that angels are listening to hear what kind of report you're bearing to the world about your Heavenly Father. And you're taking the time to gossip? 
Angels are listening. So what they want to hear is, it says, let your conversation be of him who liveth to make intercession to you before the Father. When you take the hand of a friend, let praise to God be on your lips and in your heart. This will attract your thoughts and their thoughts to Jesus Christ. Let us practice praying, brothers and sisters, because praying has the power to heal. But just talking about somebody else doesn't do anything. But prayer does. Let us practice prayer. Another thing is we need to use clean words. Some of the words that we speak are just not proper to speak. Having a foul mouth is not something to be proud of. And then you're saying, oh, we're church people. We don't need to tell us about that. Well, you'd be surprised some of the language that is used away from church in the workplace and in school by all of us at times. Again, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 29 reminds us, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Use truthful words. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 verses 37, that's Matthew chapter 5 verses 37, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. So whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. What are you saying is, let when you say yes, you mean yes. When you say no, you mean no. Because if you don't, then what you're doing is of evil. Because you're telling a lie. If your yes doesn't mean yes, and your no doesn't mean no. People need to believe what you say. Because lying lips destroy your credibility. You see, I know what you're saying. I don't practice lying. Hmm. But these little lies, they catch up with you when you get to work late. And your boss asks you, why are you late? Or when you get caught speeding. Or when the assignment doesn't come in on time. Then those little things surface. And let us not forget about tax time. When it's time to file your taxes, and you tell your tax preparer little things that may not be true so you can get back a better tax refund. So whether they're big or whether they're small, lying lips in Proverbs 12.22 are an abomination to the Lord. But they that deal truly are His delight. So saints, let us practice the rule of honesty. Let us practice that the words that flow from your mouth be truthful. And last, use edifying words. Edifying words build up and uplift the soul. We live in a world where people like tearing things down, especially reality TV. Whoa, man. I really, I started out just watching, um, the one where they go from one part of the world to the other. Um, and um, when the first one came on, when they were trapped on the island together. But after, after a while, I just couldn't get into that anymore. Because it's just, it was just too destructive, you know. The way they talk about each other and pull each other down. You know, reality TV, talk show, talk radio. And let's not forget our politicians. Wow. Character assassination. Hmm. They attack each other's characters just so that you will vote for them in, in, instead of voting for the other people. Wow. There is a continual display of pulling people down instead of building them up. And what's so sad is that the misuse of these words and actions can bring destruction spiritually, spiritually, as I said, emotionally and physically. We see it in our schools where students are being bullied and great catastrophes have happened and a lot of deaths have taken place even last week in Washington State because of the words. Oh my word, we need to pray for our young people. 
we see it in the suicide rates that are high and plaguing our nation because there are a lot of teenagers, a lot of young people and adults who have low self-esteem problems and easily succumb when they are hurt by negative words. It's so sad, I heard about a young lady who is 17 years old who talks her boyfriend into killing himself. And just think about just what young people go through. We really need to pray for our young people. Romans 15 verses 2 says, Let every one of us, not some of us, but let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. And one of the wisest men that ever lived, King Solomon, in Proverbs 25, verses 11, Proverbs 25, verses 11, said, But a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. Words that are suitable and properly spoken is a beautiful thing. So, I thought about some words that we can say sometimes that maybe you don't know positive words, but sometimes when you see people, if you don't have anything to say really, don't say anything at all. But some things you can say to people besides Happy Sabbath is, you look great today. You have a wonderful smile. And the tone that you use is very careful. I appreciate you. Have a blessed day. You are strong in the Lord. I am very proud of you. You are inspiring. You are smart. You are a special person. I really appreciate our friendship. You have an excellent demeanor. I love your leadership skills. Girl, you're a child, man, you're a child of God, and I love you. These are some of the words that we can practice just using. I know that word, I love you. My mom, I enjoyed it because when we were young, she used to say she didn't get a lot of hugs, so she made sure we got a lot of hugs. But there's never a time or a conversation that I have with my mom on the phone where she does not end by saying, I love you. Because you don't know if that's the last time you'll have a conversation. But I know that my mom always loves me. So no matter what's going on in life, she loves me. And I know that. And I thank my husband too for always being there. Like it was my birthday just went by and he sent out something on Facebook that says, you know, to the love of my life. That makes me feel good. Let us practice using positive words. Of course, the best example of how, of how effective righteous words can be used was when Jesus was on earth. When Jesus was speaking in the temple courts to the crowds that were there, even the hardened hearts of the temple guards began to melt. In John 7 verses 46, they made it clear. They said, never a man spake like this, like he did. And the two disciples who were walking with him from Emmaus was typical of how people reacted to God during his ministry here on earth. Their words are recorded in Luke chapter 24 verses 32 where he says, they say, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Their hearts were warmed and uplifted by the scriptures that Jesus explained to them. Jesus is our perfect example. Jesus' words were wise, uplifting, encouraging, knowledgeable, and cautious. Even when he issued a rebuke, he did so in the spirit of love, with the intention of saving the offending person. He understood the force of simple eloquence and the power of silence. Positive, encouraging words can inspire both the listener and the speaker. Because when you're giving joy to someone else, it makes you feel good also. And one of the most eloquent speeches he ever gave was the Sermon on the Mount that contains the Beatitudes, where he was blessing people. That was our Savior. 
So the scriptures make it very clear that the only permanent remedy for our tongues lie in the power of the master teacher, God. He is the only one who can transform our hearts and our minds and enable us to speak words that are pure and of good report. We also need to cherish God's word. And as the Apostle Paul reminds us in Philippians 4 verse 13, that's Philippians 4 verses 13. It says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. We need to choose Jesus every day, not just once a week, but waiting for you to come to church on Sabbath to get it. No. If you want to have this positive spirit that issues positive words, you need to have a communication with him every single day. And I should say sometimes, not just even in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, before you go to sleep, every day. That's the only way that you will subdue that tongue so that positive, enriching, and enlightening words will come out of it. We also need to read the promises that are presented in the Bible. It's so amazing in Proverbs. It's like almost everything you read in Proverbs is like something, it's, it's all positive because it's coming from one of the wisest men on earth, which is King Solomon. So when we're tempted to say things that are evil, we really need to ask for the power of Jesus Christ. And then when he gives the power through his Holy Spirit, we can claim the victory and praise him for it. Our tongues will engage what goes on in our mind. So let us practice Philippians 4, verses 8. I love Philippians chapter 4, verses 8. And Philippians 4, verses 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. So take a moment, brothers and sisters, as you go into the week. Well, take a moment from now on into the rest of the week and into the rest of your lives to take a moment to think before you speak. I got this great um, acronym that will help you think before you speak. And of course, what is the acronym? The acronym is THINK. T-H-I-N-K. So before you say something, if you're not quite sure, THINK. T. Is it true? So before you say something out of your mouth, T. Is it true? If it's not, don't say it at all. H. Is it helpful? Because really, if you're not going to help me, don't say anything. So T, is it true? H, is it helpful? I, is it inspiring? N, is it necessary? T, is it true? H, is it helpful? I, is it inspiring? N, is it necessary? And K, is it kind? If what you're going to say does not pass this simple test, then don't say it. Just smile. So, brothers and sisters, I hope this will help you and help us because the Lord is coming soon. Every day we see catastrophes around us. Earthquakes are happening almost every day now. Look at what just happened in Mexico. You know, I didn't even know this was going on, you know, because first we were so concerned about Harvey and then Irma, and then here comes, you know, all these catastrophes happening. And they're happening in fast succession, which tells us time is wrapping up. So we really need to be about God's business. And we have a, a prophecy series coming up, and he needs us to be spiritually ready and awakened because there are people who will be coming in, and we need to be ready for them. So people, and my brothers and sisters, and I'm talking to myself also, let us prepare ourselves so that we will be ready for the coming of God. Praise Him. Amen. So at this time, I just ask you to stand as we sing our closing hymn, Wonderful Words of Life. And next time when you say something, you'll think, what did I say? Before you say it. God bless.